But we are going to have two speakers this afternoon. So uh, our first is going to be Dr. Kelly Cottle, and then uh, the second is um, Dr. David Gregornik, uh, who's at Children's Minnesota. And our afternoon session is titled Translating Pharmacogenomic Research into Evidence-Based Medication and Dosing Recommendations. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce Dr. Cottle and then uh, let her take the stage. So Dr. Cottle is the, uh, the CPIC director at St. Jude's Research Hospital and is an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Um, she oversees the CPIC guideline development process, evidence reviews, and the writing of those manuscripts. And as a member of CPIC and on one of those guidelines, I can vouch that Kelly puts a lot of time and does a lot of wrangling of opinions um, to help put some of those guidelines together. Uh, she also serves as a preceptor for pharmacogenomics for pharmacy students. Um, on rotation at St. Jude, and also has several publications in the area of pharmacogenetics and implement, uh, implementation of pharmacogenetics in the clinic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cottle. Yes, okay, great. Well, hi. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak here again. Um, this is a great opportunity, I hope, to promote CPIC. So, and to talk about FDA labeling, and to talk about what to do if you do not have a CPIC guideline or FDA labeling. So I think the title tells you everything I'll be talking about today. Um, but I wanted to start, but I'm just curious. We've talked a lot about CPIC this morning, which I love to hear, but I'm curious to know who in the room already knew about CPIC before you came today? So a lot. I'm not gonna ask who didn't, because that might be, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's good. So hopefully um, what I'm gonna show you today is stuff that, um, some, some stuff you probably already know, but might kind of help you understand when you see the recommendations that we've been talking about all day, how do we get to that? And so he kind of alluded to the conference calls that we have, and I do sometimes think of myself as a bit of herding cats, not to call you guys cats, but sometimes everybody comes into these calls um, kind of with a different way of thinking about it, but that's what it's about. Um, we bring together experts in the field. So if we're gonna do a psychiatry, something that's with antidepressants or um, one of those drugs, we make sure we have people from that field. You know, we also have that gene expert on each one of our guidelines. And, and then of course we have, we always try to have the voice of somebody who's implementing a guide, implementing pharmacogenetics so that hopefully we're getting a lot of perspectives on each one of our guidelines. Um, but just a, a quick overview about what CPIC is, just in case you don't know. Um, CPIC writes guidelines, clinical practice guidelines, that are designed to help clinicians understand how available genetic test results should be used um, to optimize therapy, but, not, but we don't discuss whether you should order this test or not. Um, I mean, today, three, how many y'all genotype in all? I know you just presented 175, but there's 300 plus people here. So 200 of you are gonna walk away with your genotype in hand, and you're gonna take this to your physician, hopefully, if you have one that's actionable on there, and he's gonna go, I have no idea what to do with this. And you go, you know what? I'm printing out the CPIC guideline just for you. So that's what it's there for um, <laughs> in a lot of ways, because um, right now, the field, in a way, a lot of clinicians don't quite know what to do when they, uh, somebody brings them this genotype. And this has become more common practice, especially with the preemptive, um, where you might order a panel for one gene, but now you've got this full panel. Or you might order one gene, like CYP2D6, for a particular drug, but now you know that it affects a lot of drugs. So um, this, you've got that CPIC guideline there for you. Um, so just a few key points about a CPIC guideline I always like to point out. Um, we do use a standardized format, so each CPIC guideline has about the same sections. Um, we try not to um, change that up too much so that if you use our guidelines, you, you know where to find that information. Um, we do have grading of the evidence and recommendations, so we have a separate grading system for the evidence and also for the recommendations. Um, all our guidelines are peer-reviewed. We have over 250 CPIC members, so they get the first um, chance to peer review, and then of course it goes into the journal process of peer review. These are freely available, so if you ever have a student that comes to you and says they can't find it, uh, they didn't look hard enough, um, because I've, I've sat there on Google a lot, making sure that it's one of the first things that pops up um, if you Google something about CPIC, um, so I'll show you where to find those here in a minute. Um, we do update. So as Julie was talking, I was like, oh, we need to update that clopidogrel guideline because it's been five years. So we do try to update at least every five years, but we are, it's an ongoing process for CPIC. We work very closely with PharmGKB. I'll show you about PharmGKB here in a moment. So if anything um, is published in the literature that might make us change our mind about our recommendation, we would uh, update that guideline almost immediately. And we can do this on our website, and I can show you that too. So we do update. We don't have a set time that we update, we update when needed, but we at least try to do it every five years. 
Um, we do have a, a strong policy on conflict of interest um, for our authors, and then our, um, you know, there was a lot of controversy in the you know, literature about trustworthy guidelines, and so the IOM um, came out with um, practices for writing um, trustworthy guidelines, and we follow each one of those standards almost to the T, to the best that we can. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of patient involvement in our guideline process, but something we are trying to work towards. Um, so, I, I didn't update this on accidentally, but we have um, over 250 members of CPIC right now. Um, we do try to include in each one of our guideline panels at least somebody um, internationally, especially if it's something like HLA. We want to make sure we have that Asian representative and sometimes um, several um, on that guideline. Um, but you can see that we have uh, members throughout the United States and throughout Europe and Asia. Um, to date, okay, we have 20 guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> that cover over 40 drugs, um, and it depends on how and what list you count, but last time I counted, I think we were at 42 drugs. Um, and so this slide, I know it's very busy. This I have on the CPIC website uh, under resources. So um, a lot of the slides I'm presenting today just about CPIC are available to you freely. I do try to keep those updated. So if you're interested to see what we're working on, you can find them there, you can find it there. Um, I will tell you, good news, we are submitting the TPMT Nut T15 update. So the TPMT guideline um, is now going to include an additional gene, Nut T15, that will be submitted um, next week along with the RYR1 and Held Anesthetic guidelines. So both of them will be going in. Uh, we just finished CPIC review for both of these. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, I get a lot of questions about how do you evaluate the evidence before a CPIC guideline, so I thought, I think this is a, the best way to think about it. Um, so the first thing you have to think about is that gene-drug association, right? I mean, is there an association between this genetic variation and drug response? Um, and so of course we look at observational studies, if there are randomized clinical trials or studies, um, preclinical, clinical studies. Case reports, yes, we look at case reports that might be more hypothesis generating, but at least it makes us aware that there, there, there's this particular variant and then somebody had a toxicity with it. Um, and then we, of course, use in vivo PK data um, in functional studies as well. But I think, so I, I do get a lot of emails being the CPIC director about, hey, there's a lot of great association with this particular gene and this particular drug, um, and why, do, why is there not a CPIC guideline? And then when I really start thinking about it, um, my next question is, is it actionable? Can I, is there something I can do to change prescribing of this drug? Because until I can, there will not be a CPIC guideline. Um, and so things that we think about, and I'll give you a good example here that we've seen a lot about today, CYP2C19 and clopidogrel, because it's kind of our slam dunk right now, I think. Um, but it's the, we first, you gotta think about therapeutic index. If a, if a drug has a very large therapeutic window, you know, uh, really maybe having your poor metabolizer of that particular drug, it maybe it doesn't matter um, that you have the higher levels of that drug, you're not gonna see much toxicity. So that kind of is really important. Severity of disease, what are we treating? How important is it that we get the right drug to the right patient at the right time? How important is that? Um, the consequences of suboptimal prescribing, Obviously, if we give too much of the drug to this patient, will they have toxicities, or of course, if it's activated, the opposite, and vice versa. And then, of course, the available, availability of a genetic test. If nobody's doing a genetic test for this, and actually, this is my response a lot back to these emails, is yes, I agree that there's a lot of great evidence there, but nobody really tests for this one yet. Um, and then availability of and the evidence for alternative therapy. So the first thing we do is, of course, we look at the evidence. So let's go through an example. I'm going to go through this quickly because we've seen it now, what, four times today, I think. <laughs> um, so we know that clopidogrel requires CYP2C19 to be um, activated in the liver. Um, we have good studies that show an association between more CV events um, with particular CYP2C19 alleles. Okay, so we've got good, strong evidence for an association. Now let's talk about that clinical actionability. Um, so is there a narrow therapeutic index? Absolutely, we've got bleeding on one side, thrombus on the other. Um, severity of the underlying disease, yes, of course, we're preventing stroke, my myocardial infarction. Um, consequences of suboptimal prescribing could be very serious. Um, availability of a genetic test, yes, this one's being genetic tested and availability of and evidence for an alternative therapy. So if we aren't going to use clopidogrel, do we have another drug we can recommend? And this right here is where we stop some CPIC guidelines because we just, there's not an alternative drug yet on the market that's been shown to be just as, um, to be just as good as that, that particular drug that we're looking at. So, but in this case, yes, yes there is. 
Um, and so this is available also on our website. So this kind of walks through kind of the way we think about uh, genes and drugs. There's actually a full list um, of gene drugs. I'll kind of show you a snippet of it later um, where we've gone through um, a lot of drugs. So pretty much if there's FDA labeling on the drug or a PharmGKB clinical annotation level is around a 2B, or a 2 or higher, we've got a list of all of these gene drug pairs and we've kind of preliminarily assigned a CPIC level. So what do the CPIC levels mean? Um, so if you go to the top, I don't, is there a pointer? Let's, I guess not. If you, there's a pointer. Let's see. Oh, see it? Yeah. Can you see? Let's see. Oh. Oh, that's okay. Oh, I see it, I see, sorry, thank you. Ah, there we go, okay. So if you start at the top up here, one of the first things that we do ask about is, is the gene already subject to a CPIC guideline? And this is a lot because if you, if people, we've already provi providing one recommendation for CYP2D6, it's more likely more people are testing for it. So, and then a smart clinician's gonna say, hey, I know this, you know, this drug is metabolized by CYP2D6, what do you know about other drugs? So it kind of does get a higher priority for a CPIC guideline. We, of course, evaluate the alternatives and the evidence. And then we, uh, we assign it a CPIC level. So a CPIC level A or B means that we know that there's a prescribing action that will be recommended. Um, CPIC level A is when there's a strong moderate recommendation. B would be likely optional. Um, but we do know that there, there's some actionability there. Um, a CPIC level C is where this is being tested for. It's already subject of a CPIC guideline. Um, but really right now, no prescribing change based on genetics would be needed or warranted. So that would be given a CPIC level C. Um, for ones that are not already subject to a CPIC guideline, we think about a lot of things. Um, if this is something that's been brought up into a, another professional society guideline, so people might be asking about it, that might kind of move it up on our list. Um, we listen to our members, so I get a lot of, of these gene drug pairs uh, nominated by our members or um, sometimes through the FDA labeling. Um, Pharma GKB annotation level uh, one or two, and then um, even if it's mentioned in a professional society guideline but not actionable. Um, and so we would evaluate the alternatives, evidence, and degree of testing, and we would assign an A, B, C, or D, or but in this case you could also have a, a CPIC level D where uh, we're probably not gonna evaluate this one any further, probably not gonna be a CPIC guideline, and you'd have to go to Farm GKB to see more information, but I'll, I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, so again, all this is listed on our website, and so if you're ever curious, just a little bit more about how we prioritize when we're gonna start a new CPIC guideline, we have all of this listed out here. If you want to know what we're working on, this is also listed here. And I do try to keep it up to date as much as possible. Um, all our guidelines, again, are freely available from the CPIC website. That's cpicpgx.org. Um, and you can see this is, I've talked about the guidelines page and the genes drugs page. It's links from the home page there. Um, so let's, let's walk through an example. I think we've just seen this one too, but that's okay. Um, each one of our guidelines has its own web page um, where we are linking to the full um, guideline and to the supplement. And then under here, you can't see it, we have um, a lot of supplemental tables that help you implement um, the CPIC guideline into the electronic health record, or at least we're trying to provide these types of tables. Um, so you can freely get these here. Um, first step of a CPIC guideline is our evidence review. Um, sometimes we only have a handful of studies we're evaluating, but I'll tell you right now, for CYP2C19 PPI, we have identified over 220 studies. So if you ever wonder what takes us so long to get through a CPIC guideline, sometimes evidence review can take up to six, seven months just to get through all that evidence. But what we do is we combine the evidence or the outcomes um, into major findings. And you see, you see here's one major finding that these, um, these particular papers here support. And then we grade the particular major finding based on that evidence here. So we have a strong, moderate, or weak. And, I, and this is how I like to, this is, I think when I talk to the authors, this is what I say. So hi, we don't expect the net effect to change, right? So the magnitude of the effect and the direction of the effect. So that we might get a high. Moderate is maybe, we know that the direction, so we know there's gonna be decreased metabolism of this drug. Um, is, is not gonna change. We know that direction is gonna be decreased. However, maybe the magnitude might change, you know, if we have more evidence to support it. So that might get a moderate. And weak is really where just the evidence, it's, weak is generally, I think, fairly obvious when we're discussing the papers, where the numbers are just really low in the papers and we really just can't make any decision um, if, if this is actually really does support the statement or not. 
Um, so we've just saw the table one um, right before this, but it's really important and a huge step of the CPIT guideline is defining allele function. And allele function is very important in assigning phenotype, okay? So you've got here, let's go with the CYP2C19 intermediate metabolizer example. See how it's defined? It's defined by the combination of these two alleles. So a person with one normal function plus um, one no function allele would be defined as an intermediate. Well, now we have to define what normal means and what intermediate, I mean, what a decreased function means. Um, and so we have a supplemental table where we do this. This has become a very huge part of the CPIT guideline um, where we are defining function, um, trying to be as systematic as we can. Um, a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of in vitro papers that are very difficult to get through, assays aren't very good, so it's, it's, it, this has not been an easy task for us. Um, but where we feel like we can assign function, we do to each allele. So even if it's a rare allele, if we have enough information, we feel like we can assign function, we do. If we do not, we call it uncertain function. Um, but this has become a, a four or five call sometimes um, a thing that happens with, with our guidelines, especially for uh, genes that aren't well established, CYP2C19, CYP2D6. Don't take as long because we've got several guidelines on these, but for newer genes, it, it does. So we're going through this process for CYP2B6 right now, and it's been, um, it's been a process. Um, but after you, of course, after you've defined it, you know what your phenotype is, and this really does affect all the way up to the recommendation because our recommendation is based off of that phenotype. Um, and so we've kind of gone through this one. I think this is the example for voriconazole. Um, and CYP2C19 in adults. Um, but we also do score the classifications of the recommendations, um, moderate, strong, or um, optional, or we have a new category, so this is kind of something new, which is really why I wanted to show this to you, um, is that we have a new no recommendation, and this is because we really are being pushed to start evaluating and producing guidances on these gene drug pairs where we don't think are actionable, and so we would say there's no recommendation at this time which could be clinically just as important as to act on it, honestly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. So I've told you a little bit about CPIC, how we get to that. And, and one thing I forgot to tell you about the recommendation is that um, we really do have many calls on that. Um, we talk about the wording of the recommendation. When, when you see the two sentences that are there and that you have no idea how many edits it's gone through, we've argued over the word consider. Um, right now there's this huge argument about what relative contraindication means. Um, so we do take a lot of thought and think about how we are wording this. And during CPIC review, I think that's our first time to kind of show the group what we've done. And sometimes that's the best responses we get is, hey, this is worded a little awkwardly. Can you, can you help us with this? So if you are a CPIC member and you've had a chance to review our, our guidelines, you know, think about that. Because that's, we want to make sure we can do this in a couple of sentences, but then also make sure that you understand what we mean by our recommendation. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears now. So um, let's talk about FDA labeling a little bit. Um, how many people have ever pulled up an FDA label and just looked at it? Just, just, okay. Um, and so one thing that's always bothered me about pharmacogenetic information within this labeling, it's just all over the place. Um, and thankfully somebody's looked into this, so I was able to pull some results from a study um, that this looked at um, drug metabolism genes only. Um, but they looked at information and recommendations in FDA labeling. They found it for 84 gene drug pairs were identified with PGX related to drug metabolism. Not recommendations, but just drug metabolisms. And so you'll see um, there are a lot of different places where you can find this information. So I can't imagine a clinician, a busy clinician, having to pull a label to find out if there's any you know, correlation between CYP2D6 and this particular drug because it's really not gonna be in one particular section. It's not standardized. And what happens is, is this information that gets translated into the drug resource in the same way. So I go to LexiComp or Micromedics, and my gosh, it's all over the place. You can't find it. Um, and the ones in red, um, this is where you might actually find actionable recommendations, and it's still not standard. Sometimes it's in the warnings, sometimes it's in the contraindications, sometimes it's in the dosing, uh, do dosage and administration, sometimes it's in the box warning. So it's, it's really all over the place. But Farm GKB to the rescue. <laughs> so if you don't know about this, I'm hopefully I'm teaching you something. Um, there's a mechanism on Farm GKB. So if you go, let's say we Google, I mean, not Google, sorry, search for voriconazole. Um, and up pops this, you can, 
you get to click on drug label, but it's easy to find. And I've got here, of course, the, um, the URL, URL here as well. Um, but they break it down for you and they show you um, how much information is in the label. And I'll show you, they actually show you where in the label the information is. But they call it, is it actionable? Is it informative? And I'm running a little, little on, on time right now, so I'm gonna kind of hurry through these a bit. But all this information is here on Farm GKB. Um, and so you can see here, it, it tells you what they mean by, does the FDA label require testing? Um, is it recommended? Is it actionable? Can you act upon it? Uh, or maybe it's just informative. So important um, information that you can pull quickly. And lo and behold, they even have a summary of what the label says. And they don't just do this for the FDA. They do this for um, other, um, other, other labeling that might be out there. Um, and then if you click on, I think, they hear this voriconazole drug label, you can pull up the drug label and they've got it highlighted in there where this information is. So um, you can find this, you just have to go through PharmGKB, I think, to quickly find this information for a particular drug. And they're pretty good about um, updating this as well, I've noticed. Um, so now what do you do? You've got this uh, gene drug pair, there's no CPIC guideline, there's nothing in the FDA label about it. Um, what, what do you do? Um, so let's, let's, let's do a, a case. So you have a neurologist that comes to you and wants to know if there's any kind of pharmacogenetic implications for um, SCN1A and anti-epileptics. Um, and he's really wanting to know about phenytoin and carbamazepine because he's got this patient, or she's got this patient, um, with this particular genotype here, okay? Um, this right here is Serene Hadar. I, I put her picture here. She's the um, clinical coordinator for our pharmacogenetics program at St. Jude. So when I was asked to put this together, I turned around and asked her what's a good one. What do you get asked about a lot? And she told me this was one. So hopefully this will be something that you, um, you get asked about one day. But also it's not on your one ohm list. I, I made sure of that. So it, unfortunately not there. Um, but for, I think for a good reason though. So don't, don't, <laughs> don't start testing this one. Um, <laughs> so what is CN, um, I got that backwards, C, uh, SCN1A, um, it's just a voltage-gated a voltage -gated ion channel implicated in a genetic epilepsy. It's a sodium channel, um, but it is a major binding site of several anti-epileptic anti drugs, so um, it makes sense that if a drug's not going to bind the same, then, then it might not work as well. Um, this gene is tested, which is why I picked it. I think it's part of some prenatal screening. So you, it could be that a patient has this, or I think sometimes they might do this um, when uh, diagnosing um, epilepsy. And so the first thing I would do is I'd go right to the CPIC drug site and see, because we've kind of already pulled as much as we can from the literature on some of the ones with the stronger evidence. Um, and so we can see here that we've given it a CPIC level B, which means we think that there is actionability there, so that's good. Um, and PharmGKB gave it a 2B. Um, and so that means, and also that, so if you go to PharmGKB and you look up SCN1A, um, you'll see that there's no guideline because there'd be a prescribing guideline here. Um, and they have not done a pathway, so there's not gonna be a nice little summary of it. And for the clinical annotations, there's six. So let's talk about those for a second because these can be very informative, um, but they're not gonna have prescribing recommendations. So you click on um, a little bit more about that. You click on this clinical annotations tab and it takes you here. And now you've got um, information about, um, we know that there's some information about dosing with phenytoin. Um, and we know there's something about dosing with carbamazepine and, and something about efficacy. So if we explore more, I think I clicked on this read now here for carbamazepine. Um, uh, but what does 2B mean first? So they, they have four levels, four being maybe there's a case report. Um, three means it's been replicated somewhere, but the evidence is still pretty low. Um, level two means there's some moderate uh, association. And, level, and high is generally we are working on a CPIC guideline for that. Um, so you get to this page and you think, hmm, well, now my patient's this TT, and here it says that you are treated with carbamazepine but may require the highest dose as compared, uh, as compared to patients with a CTCC. Not very helpful clinically there. But if you kind of click down and you keep clicking down on this page, you'll see that they've annotated the papers that support this. Okay, so you pull the paper, you read the paper, paper but you're still kind of scratching your head, and they've got it for both the papers that support this, about dosing, maybe dosing higher. And then you go to, um, I think I clicked on the efficacy one, so there is some data to support that a difference in efficacy. 
However, there was four studies showing an association and three studies showing no association. So this is what we do for CPIT guidelines. It's the first thing we do. We pull up the positive negative studies and we decide kind of which ones are the weaker studies, which ones do we believe. We talk about this. Um, so if you want to do this sitting at your desk, that's fine, but we do have a group of people that, that really get together and do this. Um, so back to our case, um, you know, you're still scratching your head. Yeah, there, there's some link here, but I can't really tell you what to do. I don't know if I would increase the dose because it's, uh, you know, carbamazepine and phenytoin and there's a lot of side effects with this. Um, and so you might say, you know, this patient might not respond based on this information I just found, um, but we know there's good alternatives. So you could suggest an alternative agent just based on this, if, if you can for this particular disease, disease, diet, site, disease state. Um, and then one thing is you might want to more closely monitor this patient um, or it might not help so much in this case because of the type of uh, gene drug association it is, but for some drugs, especially the ones with pharmacokinetic implication, you might want to do some drug uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, so there are things you can do even when there's moderate weak. I call these informative. You know, they might not be actionable now, but they are definitely informative, can be used clinically. Um, but that's how I would approach it if I didn't have a CPIC. Actually, it's funny because this is how I approach it when I'm evaluating it for a CPIC guideline. So it was uh, easy for me to kind of throw these together. Um, but with that, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, um, especially CPIC, CPIC members. We, we really are a great group of, of, of people who are very passionate about pharmacogenetics. And, and I've had such a, it's been such a joy working with this group. So thank you. Right. Thanks, Dr. Cottle. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, my name is Mary Toma. I just wonder why you don't use more meta-analyses when you're coming up with your recommendations. We do look at them, um, and if there is a good one, you'll see a nice paragraph generally in the, in, the, um, in the actual guideline kind of describing what that found and how we did use that. Um, but we do try to do a systematic review from the very top to the bottom and include everything we can. But we do, we definitely do. They don't get included in our evidence table, but they're most likely discussed in the text and how we did use it when we're coming up with the recommendation. But you don't actually, you don't actually do meta-analysis on no. the data, though. No. It, it, it would be, if there were simple ways to put the outcomes together in a measurable way <laughs> for a lot of these, we probably would. But it's, it's very difficult when you start really looking at how they've genotyped, how they've compared their comparison groups. It, it becomes very messy and tricky. Yeah. For some gene drug pairs. Yeah. Dr. Van Ness? Um, the CPIC also includes the Dutch Working Group recommendations. By and large, you're in agreement, but occasionally there are some disagreements in recommendations. How do you resolve those? So I think there's two, two ways to look at this. So one is there, we do have some differences in the way we translate genotype to phenotype. We are working to get that resolved because I think, I think it's really important that those match up. Um, but I, the, when there's differences in recommendations, there's a few things that could it be. Um, one, we've noted that they haven't updated their guidelines since 2011. So, um, in English, they have updated and they're just not in English, okay, so, and so we don't have access to them now, but you know they are publishing their own independent guidelines now too, so, um, but that's one reason. So we might have some studies that might have changed our recommendations since 2011. Um, the other side of this is, is practices are different in different parts of the, of the world. And so sometimes a difference in the recommendation might just be a preference to the, the, the way we treat our patients differently between the, the two countries. We actually wrote a paper on this um, comparing the CPIC and the Dutch guidelines and we worked together to come up with that with the thought that at the end of this we would really start putting our heads together and how we can really work together to, and we might be, it might be that one day we're publishing a few guidelines together where there's not that many differences in the way we practice for those particular drugs. All right. Thanks, Dr. Cottle.